across the internet. We do multi-stream here in case you're not familiar with the program. That means we broadcast on Facebook and YouTube and Periscope and even Twitch right now, but YouTube always takes a minute to get started and it looks like we're live, so let's get rocking and rolling. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live. My name is Robert Gruler. I am a controversial and harmful to viewers criminal defense attorney here at the R&R Law Group in the always beautiful and sunny Scottsdale, Arizona, where my team and I, over the course of many years, have represented thousands of good people facing criminal charges. And throughout my time in practice, I have seen a lot of problems with our justice system. I'm talking about misconduct involving the police. We have prosecutors behaving poorly. We have judges not particularly interested in a little thing called justice. And we all know that it starts with the politicians. The people at the top, the ones who write the rules and pass the laws that they expect you and I to follow, but sometimes have a little bit of difficulty doing so themselves. So that's why we started this program called Watching the Watchers, so that together with your help, we can shine that big, beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency back down upon our very system with the hope of encouraging some meaningful change. We're very grateful that you are here and with us today. We have a little bit of a heavy show today. We're gonna be talking about some of the election stuff. That's not the heavy part that I'm talking about, but we are going to get into this new story from Time Magazine. They are uh, sort of being very, uh, very transparent about what happened this last election season. Uh, this new article says that there was this massive effort, sort of this shadow campaign that was uh, set in motion to help the Democrats and help Joe Biden. We want to break down what that article says. Now, I can't say anything about the F word as it relates to the election 2020 and any of that stuff, but there is another word that may come to light, another F word that we can talk about called fortification, election fortification. So that is something that is uh, apparently a thing now that's okay and uh, allowed to, we can talk about it. So we're going to do so. We are also going to get into this story about the uh, McKinsey company. There is this company known as McKinsey that was really involved in the opioid crisis along with the Purdue and the Sackler families. Well, they just entered into a settlement for a nine figure sum, a lot of money. We have a copy of the settlement. We have a copy of the original complaint. There are thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people who are impacted by the opioid crisis around this country. And one of the biggest proponents of it in, in the form of a company by the name of McKinsey is uh, now entering into an agreement. They're gonna pay several hundred million dollars. And the question is, is that good enough based on some of the allegations. So we're going to get into that. I have a little personal connection to some of that stuff. So we'll see where that goes. And then finally, we're going to talk about another tragedy in law enforcement. There is a deputy by the name of Clyde Kerr, who is no longer with us. He died by suicide uh, very recently. And it's a it's a wild story. So we're going to break through all of that as well. So it's a little bit of a, you know, some tragedy that we're going to uh, talk about today. So brace yourselves for that. Then we're going to stick around for the live chat. We tried the live chat yesterday on our platform over at Locals. It's watching the watchers locals .com kind of where our home base has been for a little bit now. We've got a copy of the slides, which are going to be available over there. We've also got a copy of my book, the impeachment party template. We have the existence systems over there, but the live chat is where we're going to take questions. So if you want to ask a question or share a comment or share an article or anything like that, head on over to locals.com and find the watching the watchers channel and Miss Faith and Mr. Ma are over there uh, as well on YouTube. They're making sure everything is uh, operating smoothly. And so thank you to those uh, two individuals for helping us on the program today. All right, let's get into the news. As I mentioned, I wanted to start with this article from Time. It says it's the secret history of the shadow campaign that saved the 2020 election. And when I first saw this come across my, uh, actually a number of you sent this to me, which is awesome. Thank you. It is, uh, I was like, wait a minute, what are they kidding us right now? We just got done with about two months of them telling us that there was no evidence of widespread voter fraud. Every single claim relating to voter fraud or, or any of the electoral integrity issues that Trump and his campaign lawyers were bringing up. All of that was baseless. Remember that word? And the sort of the, the, the narrative kept shifting around from, well, there's no evidence that to there's there's no widespread evidence. Now everything is baseless. And we sort of were going through that progression in real time as we were responding to the daily news. And now it has sort of even morphed into something that's more dangerous. Now we see that all of this election disinformation was responsible for cultivating dangerous individuals 
And that turned into insurrection, which stormed the Capitol, which was undermining American democracy. And many of us were saying, wait, wait a minute. What, you know, how, how do you go from some people have questions about electoral integrity all the way to now they're dangerous insurrectionists who have to have their platforms, uh, you know, canceled and they have to be investigated by the CIA, according to John Brennan and these other individuals who are now talking about, you know, using insurgency tactics on local American citizens. We're all just scratching our heads here going, uh, I, that's, I, I think, I think we're talking about two different things here, but okay. And so now when the story comes out, time is saying, yeah, Hey, by the way, there was a secret history. There was a shadow campaign that saved the 2020 election. All of us are going, yeah, we, we were, I'm not going to say I told you so. I can't do that here because that you know of, of some of the rules now. But it, we're 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 not going to say that. But this is the same stuff that we've been talking about. We've been sort of raising flags about this stuff for some time. So now that the now that Time Magazine comes out and says, yeah, basically, uh, you're, you're you're right. I mean, there was all of this going on, and uh, we're just going to talk about it out in the open. It seems very brazen, but I do want to go through it because if you haven't read this article, I would encourage you to read the whole thing. We're not going to read through the whole thing. Uh, I know some other shows are doing that, uh, but I'm not going to do that here. What we're going to do is break this article up, and then I'm going to take you back through some of the other slides that we had covered previously when we were discussing uh, litigation before the election took place on November 3rd and afterwards. And so go read the whole article because we're not going to read the whole thing here, but I am going to flip through a couple things and I want to make some points. So a, uh, so they, they start off this article by saying, uh, you know, there, there, a strange thing happened on November 3rd. It wasn't the meltdown of the country. They're saying a second odd thing happened amid Trump's attempts to reverse the result. Corporate America turned on him. And so this is where the cabal kind of starts. Hundreds of major business leaders, many of whom back Trump before called on him to concede the president felt a miss he said on December 2nd it all was very very strange within days after the election we witnessed an orchestrated effort to anoint the winner even while many states were still being counted yeah and we all noticed that too right we saw that on election night we saw Fox News calling Arizona we saw other states say the votes weren't being counted yet we saw uh, these big spikes in voting and the whole thing just felt like it was already decided before it was actually over. And now, as we we're going to find out, there was uh, a point to that. And so they say when, you know, Donald Trump was saying, uh, well, in a way, Trump was right. There was a conspiracy. This is from the Time magazine. OK, there was a conspiracy unfolding behind the scenes, one that curtailed the protest and coordinated the resistance from CEOs. Both surprises were the result of an informal alliance between left wing activists and business titans. The pact was formalized in a terse, little noticed joint statement of the U.S. Chamber of Commer Commerce, which is supposed to be typically a Republican ish organization and this AFL-CIO, which is the big labor union. They published this on election day. Both, both sides would come to see it as a sort of implicit bargain inspired by the summer's massive, sometimes destructive racial justice protests in which forces of labor came together with forces of capital to keep peace and oppose Trump's assault on democracy. And so, you know, this goes on. Uh, I wanted to point out a couple other things before we, we take a look at what voter suppression is, because we're going to see that a lot of this activity, a lot of what they're talking about here is about fortifying the election. Everything that was done, all of this massive organization, this cabal, this secret campaign that they use in their title is this orchestration between big capital, big labor. They're coming together to depose a dictator who goes by the name of Donald Trump. Why did they do that? It's to force fortify America. They weren't colluding to undermine democracy. They had to do it to save democracy. You understand this? And this is where they're justifying it. They say their work touched every aspect of the election. They got states to change voting systems. Well, we talked about this. We talked about all the lawsuits where they were filing the lawsuits to change them. They changed the voting system and the laws, and they helped secure hundreds of millions in public and private funding. They fended off voter suppression lawsuits. We're going to revisit voter suppression because a lot of this is stemming around voter suppression. They recruited armies of poll workers. They got millions of people to vote by mail for the first time, all under the guise of preventing voter suppression. They successfully pressured social media companies. We've got some examples of that to take a harder line against what they're calling disinformation, but that's their definition of disinformation. They used data-driven strategies to fight viral smears. 
whole campaign, we saw this executed on a daily basis on all of the platforms. They executed a national public awareness campaign that helped Americans understand how to vote. They were preventing Trump's conspiracy theories and false claims of victories from getting more traction after Election Day. They monitored every pressure point to ensure that Trump could not overturn the result. The untold story of the election is the thousands of people of both parties who accomplished an, a, a triumph of American democracy at its very foundation, said Norm Eelson, a prominent lawyer who worked on this voter protection program. And so my question here was, okay, so we all were sort of experiencing this in real time. We were all looking around and saying, that's weird. The media seems like they're colluding with big tech. It seems like they're colluding with a lot of these other organizations. I was looking at it from a legal perspective. I went through, I don't know, 15 different lawsuits before the election even occurred and a lot of the litigation surrounding it. And we were asking the same question here. Well, are we going to get any idea on what's going on? Where are the Republicans? Where are their arguments? I said for a long time that the Republicans were legally asleep at the wheel. The Democrats were just running roughshod over them in all of their pre-election litigation. Some of these cases went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court just kind of smacked them back down. And we were saying on this show before the election, this is going to be a problem, by the way, if it's a close election, this is going to be a problem. And now we're finding out that behind the scenes, all of these organizations were working together. And so I'm thinking to myself, all right, well, that's a little bit strange. You know, why would they come out and and start discussing this stuff? Why would they reveal their secret? Why would they sort of open up the recipe book and show us what the secret sauce is made of? Because they can just continue to execute this moving forward. And they describe, they explain it in this article. They say, that's why the participants want the secret history of the 2020 election told. Even though it sounds like a paranoid fever dream, a well-funded cabal of powerful people ranging across industries and ideologies working together behind the scenes to influence perceptions change rules and laws, steer media coverage, and control the flow of information. They were not rigging the election. They were fortifying it. And they believe the public needs to understand the system's fragility in order to ensure that American democracy endures. All right. So it literally just, it just, hey, we did it in order to save America, not to undermine America. So change the rules, change the law, control the flow of information. This is their language. I'm reading from it. Steer the media coverage, work together behind the scenes to influence perceptions. That's you. They're trying to influence you. They're trying to flow the flow, control the flow of information to you. They're trying to control the media coverage that you're seeing. And if that doesn't work, they're going to change the rules and change the laws by their own admissions in their own document. And it's all stemming around this idea of voter suppression. We talked about this before the election took place. What is voter suppression? Per Wikipedia, voter suppression is a strategy that's used to influence the outcome of an election by discouraging or preventing specific groups of people from voting. And now the Democrats use this very regularly. They say, we have to get a lot of people to come out and vote. And they give us a lot of examples of what voter suppression looks like. Here's 61 examples over by the Voter Rights Alliance, Voting Rights Alliance. And when we were talking about this during the election, look at all this stuff. Basically, anything and everything is voter suppression, everything. And when you, when you, you know, sort of operate by a playbook in this manner, you can just sort of use a buzzword to accomplish anything that you want if you can define everything to fall under the umbrella of the buzzword. And so what there's voter suppression is literally everything. It's basically anything that's relating to voting and they can have it both ways. And take a look at some of these examples. So we've got, you know, tough deputy rep registrar requirements. We've got no Sunday souls at the polls, early voting, early voting cuts, no early voting, strict voter ID laws, closing DMVs and strict voter ID states, polling place relocations, reductions of polling place, inadequate or poorly trained staff. It goes on and on and on. Use of suspense list or suspend list, absentee ballot, short return deadlines, voter caging, partisan gerrymandering, police at polling stations, proof of citizenship laws, excessive voter purging, you know, clearing out the voter rolls, refusal to place polling sites on college campuses is voter suppression. Everything is voter suppression. And so if you say that now, you sort of have this political cover. You can go in and basically do anything that you want. And you just say, look, well, well, we're doing this because we want the right to vote. We want voter enfranchisement. We want everybody to come out to vote. And you say, well, but we think we should uh, check their IDs, for example. And they say, what? Excuse me? That's voter suppression, okay? We've identified that from the Voting Rights Alliance. You're a voter suppressor, and you're probably a racist as well, because typically vote, you know, people want to depress uh, uh, other minorities from voting. Well, what if the police go to a polling station? That's voter suppression. What if we want to just make sure that you're a citizenship, a citizen before you go and cast a vote? 
voter suppression. You see how this works? And so they can just get anything passed under this woke political guise because everybody now has to kowtow to that and say, you're right, I'm not a racist, go do whatever the hell you want. And this has been happening this entire election season. Everything has been based under voter suppression. And we talked about this. And this is something that both political sides do, by the way. Now, you know, the Democrats are out there now revealing this, that there was this entire cabal. It was their own shadow campaign by their own admission. They were the ones responsible for it. So I'm talking it in, in their regard. I would be extremely pissed if the Republicans were doing the same thing, controlling the information that we get because you're too stupid to understand what's going on in the world. They have to tell us. They got to put context boxes and they have to make sure that everything's censored for us because we as the American people are just so dumb that we can't figure it out on our own. And if the Republicans were competent, which they're not, then they would probably try to do the same thing. But they're just in a whole different ball game. They're playing Little League. The Democrats are playing in the Super Bowl. It's a joke. And both sides would do it if they can. And here's what the arguments typically look like. So this is another document, another slide that we went through, I think, before, right after the election. And when we're talking about the, the difference between voter suppression and voter fraud and the right to vote and election integrity, this is typically how it works. If you are a person who thinks that vote quality is more important or, or highly prioritized, higher prioritized than the quantity of the votes, then you are going to be in this top row. You're somebody who thinks that the quality of the vote is more important than the high number of votes. And if you are in that category and you're a Democrat, they're going to say that you are somebody who believes in voter suppression, okay, because you don't want people to come out and vote. So this is the pejorative term. This, mean, this is bad. You are a vote suppressioner. Not good. If you're a Republican and you are in this category, how do you identify yourselves? Well, you say, no, it's not voter suppression. This is election integrity, folks. We want to make sure that the people who are supposed to be voting are the ones voting, that we don't have a bunch of fake ballots. We don't have you know, vans delivering them uh, behind the stadium in the middle of the night after the voting deadline happened. You want to say, we want to make sure you're a citizen. We want to make sure that you are re registered to vote. You're not voting out of state. You're not voting twice. Let's see your ID to make sure you are who you say you are. That's all election integrity. So the Republicans will, will favor that. And they'll use maybe, we haven't seen it in this last election, but uh, you know they could use some suppression votes and, and, and manipulate this, right? They could just, they could have very strict rules in certain locations that would in fact suppress the votes and it, it, they might have you know a higher quality of votes so they, they may they may be able to verify that every single person who did vote at, at that time was entitled to vote but you might get a, a big swath of people who don't vote who were eligible to vote because of that voter suppression that's the democrats argument for how that works now, if you flip that, so if you turn that upside down and you say, well, we don't really care about the quality of the votes. We just want as many people to vote as possible. We don't want to disenfranchise people at all. And I, you know, I agree with that, right? We don't want people who are eligible and capable of voting to not go and vote. This is America. We want people to go out and vote. If they are not able to do that, then they shouldn't be voting. If they're not if they're not legally qualified to vote, then they shouldn't be voting. But here's what that looks like. Here's what this argument looks like. So they're saying we're not we want more people voting even if it means we get some bad votes in there. They're calling it the right to vote. Republicans by contrast call it voter fraud. So you can just sort of see if it favors the Republicans, they're going to call it election integrity. If it's going to favor the Democrats, they're going to call it voter suppression. It, when Republicans call it election integrity, Dems call it voter suppression. When Republicans call it voter fraud, Democrats call it the right to vote. So we're talking about the same two issues, but both parties are just manipulating it for marketing purposes, right? They, they have their little spin on it. Now that we know how this works, this is what they're talking about here. They're using a lot of these concepts in their entire plan. So let's go back to the Times article. Who was the person responsible for this cabal? Who led this entire shadow campaign? It's this guy, Mike Podhorser, Podhorser who, who was uh, getting started in this in the fall of 2019. He became convinced that the election was headed for disaster and he was determined to protect it. Not win it, not manipulate it, not fraudulently induce it, not ensure a Biden victory only to protect it. Got it right. This was not his usual purview. For nearly a quarter century, he was a senior advisor for the AFL-CIO, the largest union federation. He used the tactics 
tactics to help its favorite candidates win elections. Unassuming and professorial, he isn't the hair gel political strategist. Among Democratic insiders, he's known as the wizard behind some of the biggest advances in political technology in recent decades. A group of liberal strategists he brought together in early 2000s led to the creation of the Analyst Institute, a secretive firm that applies scientific methods to political campaigns. He was also involved in the founding of Catalyst, the flagship progressive data company. So that's this guy right here, Mike Podhorzer, and they created this alliance. Back in November, a potential for a meltdown was obvious. In his apartment in the D.C. suburbs, Podhorzer began working from his laptop at his kitchen table, holding back-to-back -back Zoom meetings for hours a day with his network of contacts in the progressive universe. So he wasn't you know, conversing with Republicans, right? The Republicans were going to destroy America. He's going to save it. The labor movement was a part of this cabal, this alliance. The institutional left, like Planned Parenthood, Greenpeace, resistance groups like Indivisible, Move On, progressive data geeks and strategists, representatives of donors and foundations, state-level grassroots organizers, racial justice advocates, and others. They created the cabal, the secret alliance. The meetings became the galactic center for a constellation of operatives across the left who shared overlapping goals but didn't usually work in the concrete. The group had no name, no leaders, no hierarchy. Pod played a critical behind-the-scenes role in keeping different pieces of the government together and the infrastructure and communication aligned. You have the, and here's, here's where this gets, this is exactly what we were talking about. Quote, you have the litigation space, the organizing space, the political people just focused on the win and their strategies aren't always aligned. He allowed this ecosystem to work together. And we talked all about the legal space, the litigation space. This group of attorneys, this group of lawyers, uh, many of them were led by Mark Elias, the person we talked about yesterday, I think it was, sort of the powerhouse litigation manager for the Democrats. And what did they do? How did they organize all of this? We talked about it before the election happened. Do you remember the Alliance for Retired Americans? This was a slide that we clipped from their website, and you can see the address right there. The retiredamericans.org, Pennsylvania Supreme Court rules in favor of retiree demands for mail-in ballots. This was all taking place before the election. And here's what it says. The Alliance for Retired Americans, working with its state chapters, has filed lawsuits to protect vote by mail and absentee voters in where? Florida, Maine, Michigan, Minnesota, North Carolina, Texas, Wisconsin, in addition to Pennsylvania. The lawsuit is supported by Priorities USA, which if you are familiar with politics, they have a lot of money. They raise a lot of funds for liberal causes. And this is what the diagram looks like. Priorities USA provided the funding to the Alliance for Retired Americans, and they drafted and submitted lawsuits in all of these different states. And look, there's some pretty important ones. Florida, Michigan, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. Okay, they thought that they were going to flip Texas. The biggest battleground states, this was just one component of their litigation, and we talked about it here. This is not to mention anything else that they were talking about. The organizing space, the get out the vote, the media space, the social media space. We're going to get into all of it. Securing the vote, the first task for this cabal, this shadow campaign, was overhauling America's bulky election infrastructure in the middle of a pandemic. Remember, we talked a lot about that as well. COVID, grandma, poor COVID, because grandma's not going to be able to go and vote. For the thousands of local, mostly nonpartisan officials who administer elections, the most urgent need was money. They needed protective equipment. They needed to pay for postcards, letting people know they could vote absentee or vote by mail to every voter. They needed additional scan, uh, scanners and staff to process ballots. But in March, activists appealed to Congress to steer COVID relief money to election administration. I'd like to know more about that. Where, how did that money get steered to election administration? Who was responsible for that? What activists appealed to Congress and what Congress leaders shifted COVID relief money, which should have been gone, which should have gone to COVID relief to election administration led by the leadership conference on the civil and human rights. More than 150 organizations signed a letter to every member of Congress seeking two billion in election funding. It was somewhat successful. The CARES Act passed later that month, containing 400 million in grants to state election administrators. But the next tranche of of relief funding didn't add to that number. It wasn't going to be enough. I, I, who who was responsible for that? I don't know. I mean, it sounds like there are answers for that. Private philanthropy then stepped in. An assortment of foundations contributed tens of millions in election administration funding. We talked about this, too, on the show. $300 million came in from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Quote, it was a failure at the federal level that 2,500 local election officials were forced to apply for philanthropic grants to fill their needs. Zuckerberg had the money, came up, $300 million. 
there's a different story. I'm not sure that I clipped it where I think Zuckerberg actually invited people over to his house and they had conversations about this and what to do. Yeah, this is where we get into the disinformation defense. Laura Quinn, a veteran progressive operative who co-founded Catalyst, began studying the problem. She piloted a nameless secret project, which she has never before publicly discussed. They tracked this information online, and then they tried to figure out how to combat it. One component was tracking dangerous lies that might otherwise spread unnoticed. Researchers then provided information to campaigners and media to track down the sources and expose them. The solution, she concluded, was to pressure platforms to enforce their rules, both by removing content or accounts that spread disinformation by more aggressively policing it in the first place. Basically just telling them to delete your stuff, deplatform you, cancel you. And this was an, an operation to do that. We see here where Zuckerberg invited nine, invited nine civil rights individuals over to his, his house. Quinn researched they gave ammunition to advocates pushing so, social media platforms to take a harder line. In November 2019, Zuckerberg invited nine civil rights leaders to dinner at his home where they warned him about the danger of election-related falsehoods that were already spreading unchecked. Quote, it took pushing, urging, conversations, brainstorming, all of that to get to a place where we ended up with more rigorous rules and enforcement said the CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil Human Rights. She attended the dinner. She also met with Jack Dorsey and others. Gupta has now since been nominated for Associate Attorney General by Biden. So she's campaigning to win the election, and then he's going to nominate her to the Associate Atter Attorney General position. It's a nice little quid pro Joe, isn't it? It was a struggle, but we got to the point where they understood the problem. Was it enough? Probably not. Was it le later that we wanted? Yes, but it's really important given the level of official disinformation that they had those rules in place and were tagging things and taking them down. What is she talking about? Well, you remember this? This claim about election fraud disputed. That was just one of a million different versions of this we saw. There were a lot of these. This has been contested, not officially decided, not accurate, whatever it was. Every time Trump said something, they had a new contextual tag. This was posted over from the MRC. The tech company censored Trump more than Biden. No kidding me. From May 31st, 2018 to 11 9 2020, Trump was censored 111 times. Biden, zero times, right? Because of the cabal, the shadow campaign, the secret organization that was installing asterisk Joe Biden was responsible for this censorship. They had an intention here. They executed it. That's not my opinion. They're saying it. Spreading the word is another thing that they were trying to get into. The Voting Rights Lab and into action created state-specific memes, which is illegal. The DOJ arrested somebody for memes in 2016. Illegal memes. They spread by email, text, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. They urged that every vote be counted. Together, they were viewed more than a billion times. Protect Democracy's election task force issued reports and held media briefings with high-profile experts across the political spectrum, resulting in widespread coverage of potential election issues and fact-checking of Trump's false claims. The organization's tracking polls found that the message was being heard. The percent of the public that didn't know, uh, that didn't expect to know the winner on election night gradually rose until by late October, it was over 70%. So they were just spamming everybody and saying this was not going to be settled on the night, on November 3rd. We knew exactly what Trump was going to do. He was going to try to use the fact that Democrats voted by mail and Republicans voted in person to make it look like he was ahead, claim victory, say the mail-in votes were fraudulent, and try to get him thrown out. Setting public expect expectations ahead of time helped undercut those lies. So they just were doing a little bit of what's called pre-suasion. They were setting the table. They wanted everybody to... Think exactly what their strategy was, was going to play out in front of them. And it, and it did. It had a lot of money, a lot of resources to do it. A billion times this stuff was viewed in an American election. It's a lot of times. Presumably they're not advertising to the rest of the world. And the media fell right into place. This came over from the Daily Caller. We talked about this back on November 9th. Trump's press secretary was out there. Fox News cut them off. Fox News cuts away from the tr Trump campaign press conference with Neil Cavuto saying they can't in good countenance continue showing this with pre when press secretary says the Democrats are welcoming fraud. Cut her off. Twitter also gives it a little hashtag there. 
took that screenshot back I probably right on November 9th. One. So they cut her off. Actually, I think we have that clip. One party in America that opposes verifying signatures, citizenship, residency, eligibility. There is only one party in America trying to keep observers out of the count room. And that party, my friends, is the Democrat Party. You don't take these positions because you want an honest election. You don't oppose an audit of the vote because you want an accurate count. You don't oppose our efforts at sunlight and transparency because you have nothing to hide. You take these positions because you are welcoming fraud and you are welcoming illegal voting. Our position is clear. We want to protect the franchise of the American people. We want an honest, accurate, lawful count. We want maximum sunlight. We want maximum transparency. We want every legal vote to be counted and we want every illegal vote to well, be well, well, I, I just think we have to be very clear. She's charging, uh, the other side is welcoming fraud and welcoming illegal voting. Unless she has more details to back that up, I can't in good countenance continue showing you this. I want to make sure that maybe they do have something to back that up. But that's an explosive charge to make, that the other side is effectively rigging and cheating. Uh, if she does bring proof of that, of course, we'll take you back. So far, she... All right, so, so... He, he's sort of right and he's wrong on that, right? So they didn't fraudulently steal illegal votes. They just changed the rules in order to better serve their side. So this document itself says that it was rigged, right? That they, We just read that. So is this, is, is this enough evidence for Neil Cavuto? Is he going to come back and now talk about this? Oh, yeah. Hey, by the way, it's kind of Trump kind of had a point there. My bad. Is that going to happen? I'm doubting it. People power. The summer uprising had shown that people power could have a massive impact. Activists began preparing to reprise the demonstrations if Trump tried to steal the election. Americans plan widespread protest if Trump interferes with the election, Reuters reported in October. More than 150 liberal groups, from the Women's March to the Sierra Club to the Color of Change, from Democrats.com to the Democratic Socialists of America, joined the, quote, protect the results coalition. The group's now defunct website had a map listing 400 planned post-election demonstrations to be activated via text message as soon as November 4th to stop the coup they feared. The left was ready to flood the streets. I'm sure that would have all been very peaceful, though. Very peaceful. No, nothing wrong about that at all. Were there Antifa people in there? Were there any unsavory individuals there was any of this stuff being investigated by anybody no of course not strange bedfellows who who was working together on this were there any republicans who were joining in yeah there were the chamber of commerce we already talked about it about a week before pod horser received an unexpected message the u.s chamber of commerce wanted to talk behind the scenes the business community was engaged in its own anxious discussions about how the election and its aftermath might unfold the summer's racial justice protest, which we covered, had sent a signal to business owners too the potential for economy disrupting civil disorder. It's a it's a reasonable threat given the fact that they had 150 li uh, liberal groups and 400 planned post-election demonstrations. Yeah, it could have been some serious civil disorder. They were ready to go at the drop of a button, a text message. They were ready to mobilize. With tensions running high, there was a lot of concern about unrest around the election, our breakdown in the normal way we handle contentious elections, said Neil Bradley, the chamber's executive vice president and chief policy officer. These worries had led the chamber to release a pre-election statement with the business roundtable, as well as others calling for patience and confidence as the votes were counted. Then that statement, that strange bedfellow statement, was released on election day under the names of the chamber's Commerce CEO and the AFL-CIO president Richard Trumka. The heads of the National Association of Evangelicals, the National African American Clergy Network, and it said here, it is imperative that election officials be given the space and time to count every vote in accordance with applicable laws. We call on the media, the candidates, and the American people to exercise patience with the process and trust in our system, even if it requires more times than usual. Although we may not always agree on the desired outcomes up and down the ballot, we are all united in our call for the American democratic process to proceed without violence, intimidation, or any other tactic that makes us weaker as a nation. So a very nice, very benevolent statement. Showing up and standing down, a next section. The conversation that followed was a difficult one. Led by activists charged with the protest strategy, we want to be mindful of when was the right time to call for moving masses of people into the street. Looks like they're on a trigger, hair trigger. 
As much as they were eager to, eager to mount a show of strength, mobilizing immediately could backfire and put people at risk. Protests evolved into violent clashes. Trump would use it as a pretext to send in federal agents or troops, as he had over the summer. Rather than elevate Trump's complaints by continuing to fight him, they wanted to send the message that the people had spoken. So the word went out, stand down, protect the results, announced that it would not be activating the entire national mobilization network today, but remains ready to activate if necessary. On Twitter, outraged progressives wondered what's going on. Why wasn't anyone trying to, to stop Trump's coup? Where were all the protests? Podhorzer credits the activists for their restraint. They had spent so much time getting ready to hit the streets on Wednesday, but they did it. Wednesday through Friday, there was not a single Antifa versus Proud Boy incident like everyone was expecting. And when that didn't materialize, I think the Trump campaign, I don't think the Trump campaign had a backup plan. This is the last slide I want to cover, and then we're going to switch gears. In Pod Horser's presentation, winning the vote was only the first step to winning the election. After that came winning the count. So you got to win the vote, number one. You got to win the count, number two. You got to win the certification, number three. You got to win the electoral college, number four. Then you got to win the transition, number five. All right? And we went through all of this. Steps that are formally, normally formalities, Trump would see as opportunities for disruption. So the democracy defenders, which is probably a new movie coming out on Marvel Disney soon, launched a full court press, protect democracy's local contacts, research the lawmakers' personal and political motives. Issue one ran television ads in Lansing, Michigan. The Chambers Bradley kept close tabs on the process. Womp, the former Republican congressman, called his former colleague Mike Rogers. They wrote op-eds. Three former governors from Michigan, John Engler, Rick Snyder, Democrat Jan Granholm, jointly called for Michigan's electoral votes to be free from the pressure from the White House. Engler, a former head of the business roundtable, made phone calls to influential donors and fellow GOP statesmen who could press the lawmakers privately. They were giving Trump a, a ton of grief over this, over phone calls, saying he's unduly pressurized, unduly pressuring people to, to vote one way or the other, and they're doing the exact same thing from the other end. They're doing it to protect democracy. Trump's doing it to defraud America. They're doing it to fortify the election. Aren't we just so lucky we have them in charge? They just care about us in American democracy. The members of the alliance to protect the election have gone their separate ways. This is the last paragraph. The Democracy Defense Coalition has been disbanded. Though the fight back table lives on, protect democracy and the good government advocates have turned their attention to pressing reforms in Congress now. Left-wing activists are newly empowered Civil rights groups are on guard against further attacks. Business leaders denounce the January 6th attack. And some say they will no longer donate to lawmakers who refuse to certify Biden's election. Podherzer and his allies are still holding their Zoom strategy sessions, gauging voters' views and developing new messages. Trump is in Florida, facing his second impeachment, deprived of Twitter, that he used to push the nation to its breaking point. Oh, wow. Well, folks, we came close to... to uh, to disaster. Thankfully, though, we had this secret campaign, this cabal of intellectuals, people who know more than we do about about America. They know, you know, what stories they can share. Uh, I'm very grateful that more Americans, you know, didn't hear about Hunter Biden, for example, that was whitewashed by the media, whitewashed by social media as well. Not allowed to talk about any of that stuff, which is a good thing because it would have probably. Uh, you know, it probably would have dissuaded a lot of stupid idiot Americans to maybe consider voting for someone else. And we don't want that to happen. We don't want those dummies out there to get disinformation. So we're just going to, we're just going to, you know, set up this war room and we're going to seize all of the different institutions of power. We're going to have the lawyers go in and change the rules. We're going to have the media make sure that they have the cover. We're going to make sure social media doesn't support our opponents. We're going to make sure we have enough boots on the ground. We're going to make sure we got enough money to fund this all by our own government for election integrity, for the right to vote. Because if you don't support any of this, you're killing grandma. COVID's going to kill everybody. So we got to make sure that the rules are manipulated and we got to get government funding to do it. All of these changes are a large part of them. They were either funded by Zuckerberg, some other private philanthropist, if you want to call them that, and you, the American people, your tax dollars. And they just ran hog wild with it and it worked. And they're just admitting it right out in the open now. We all were 
saying it. Now they are too. Glad they're acknowledging it. Thank you, Time Magazine. All right, next story. This next story is a little bit rough. It involves the opioid epidemic, the opioid crisis. You may not have seen this. This has been going on for a long period of time. There's a company out there that goes by the name of McKinsey. McKinsey is a global consulting company. Very, very good at what they do. Very expensive. Very thorough. They're basically world-renowned. They were working with another company called Purdue. Purdue was the manufacturer of OxyContin, a very serious opioid that has resulted in many, many deaths throughout this country. Many more people addicted to that drug will later go to heroin and some of the harder drugs as a result. When they can no longer get this, that's where they turn. And for almost two decades, they were running hog wild around this country. They were selling drugs and just handing them out like Skittles to everybody. Today, McKinsey entered into a settlement, or this might have been yesterday, where they're going to pay for some of the damage that they caused. This article comes from statnews.com. McKinsey agrees to a $573 million settlement over advice given to Purdue and other opioid makers. So Purdue was the manufacturer. McKinsey was basically a consulting and marketing company. They're a consulting firm. They reached a $573 million settlement. 47 states over its work advising Purdue and other drug makers to aggressively market opioid painkillers. I'm a criminal defense attorney. I know people who are in jail or prison for these types of offenses. In other words, if you would have sold a drug to somebody illegally, given out a prescription drug and they would have caught you with this, it would be a possession of narcotic, possession of dangerous drug, depending on the drug, and you would be charged with a class four felony here in Arizona. The presumptive sentence on that is two and a half years in prison. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the baseline. Just think, think about that. Think about what your average drug dealer person who's got a drug addict or somebody who's just in possession of drugs, what the penalties would be for them as we go through this. The first national settlement to emerge from the massive opioid litigation filed by state, county, and local governments against opioid manufacturers over the last several years. This deal is the first to result in a substantial payment to the states to address the epidemics. The fund will be used for prevention, treatment, and recovery efforts. About 573 million bucks. McKinsey contributed to the opioid crisis by selling marketing schemes and consulting services, according to the court documents. We're going to go through some of them. As one example, the consulting giant helped Purdue design plans to, quote, turbocharge OxyContin sales during the height of the opioid crisis. The consulting firm dubbed the plan Evolve to Excellence, which significantly increased sales. The McKinsey team advised Purdue to consider paying rebates of up to $14,000 to health insurance insurers for each patient harmed by Oxy in order to maintain those crucial business relationships. They calculated Oxy was involved in just 4% of overdose deaths or opioid use disorder diagnoses and estimated there were about 50 such incidents per 1 million people covered by the health insurers. They advised Purdue to focus on higher, more lucrative dosages. They increased sales rep visits to high-volume opioid prescribers. They wanted to target doctors with specific messaging to convince them to prescribe more to patients and to deliver Oxy directly to patients through mail-order pharmacies to circumvent the retail pharmacy restrictions on high-dose, suspicious prescriptions. So just massive amounts of drug peddling. And they knew what they were doing. Okay, look at these numbers. They calculated what the damage was. I think they underestimated it probably by you know, a factor of 5, 10, I don't know. 4% of overdose deaths, opioid use disorder diagnoses, 50 such incidents per a million people. So they knew what the numbers were. They knew that people were getting addicted to this stuff, and they sold it anyways, and they wanted to sell more. And they went in and they said, hey, what if we just mail it to people? Then we don't have to go to a pharmacy. It's a pain to get the drug, the, the, the drug addicts into the pharmacy. Let's just ship it right to their house and bill the insurers. They want to target doctors with specific messages to prescribe more drugs, more drugs, more drugs for everybody. As part of the settlement, 
McKinsey is required to turn over thousands of documents detailing its work for Purdue and other opioid companies for public disclosure online, which I'm happy for the internet to get a hold of. The agreement also imposes court-ordered ethics rules that McKinsey must implement, including strict company-wide standards for document retention, conflict disclosures on state contracts. This a consulting firm also agreed to stop advising companies on potentially dangerous Schedule II, Schedule III narcotics. We're going to get into some of the documents. We're going to get into the original complaint that was filed by the state of Massachusetts that was joined by 46 other states suing them for some of the harm. Then we're going to look at the settlement agreement. Before we do, I want to show you what their press release says. What does McKinsey have to say about this? This news article came out. Settlement was entered. They responded. Then we're going to get into what, what the original allegations were. Okay, let's take a look at this first. McKinsey reaches agreements with 49 state attorneys general to resolve investigations into its past work. McKinsey and Company, this is posted on their website. Settlement funds will immediately contribute to the state's opioid relief efforts. Thanks, guys. McKinsey and Company today reach a settlement. Five territories, 49 states related to the past advisory work. Nearly $600 million with the states will use to address the impact of the opioid epidemic in their communities. McKinsey has reaffirmed the commitment it made two years ago, when they first got investigated, to not advise any clients on opioid-related business. As part of the agreement, the Attorney General recognized McKinsey's, this is where they're puffing themselves up, their good faith and responsible corporate citizenship in reaching this resolution. Oh, that's nice. McKinsey believes its past work was lawful and has denied allegations to the contrary. The settlement agreements themselves contain no admission of wrongdoing or liability. So we're going to read, we're going to read through what the original complaint was. You can decide if that's, uh, if that's accurate or not. Kevin Sneeder, the global managing partner of McKinsey, said, quote, we chose to resolve this matter in order to provide fast, meaningful support to communities across the United States. Isn't that just swell? What a, what a guy. We deeply regret that we did not adequately, adequately acknowledge the tragic consequences of the epidemic unfolding in our communities. With this agreement, we hope to be a part of the solution to the opioid crisis in the U.S. What a guy. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you for that. Thanks for, for uh, 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 shipping out $573 million to the rest of America. Well done two years ago as a result of a highly litigated settlement agreement in which your attorneys fought for zero liability, no admission of wrongdoing, no acceptance of any responsibility for it. You said your past work was lawful. You denied any allegations to the contrary. All right, let's look at what the original complaint looks like. Okay, this is what Massachusetts sued them for a couple years ago. The original complaint. Now, this is just a complaint. These aren't proven allegations. But this is a public record. It's a public document. You can go find it on the internet. This is what the state of Massachusetts was saying that they did. So you can, you know, look, look I'm a, I appreciate a good defense more than anybody. I understand that you're innocent until proven guilty. I believe in that standard. They just entered into a settlement agreement and they finagled their way out of accepting any responsibility. Let's see what Massachusetts has to say. And you should, you should acknowledge this as a viewer. This is not something that they are agreeing. They're denying this, that any of this is true. And it's not in the settlement agreement. So this is not, is not fact according to that final result of this case. This is just what the original allegations were from Massachusetts. All right, you can take them with a grain of salt if you want, or you can take them as fact if you want, if you prefer. Here's what the complaint says. Let's, let's visit this. The plaintiff of Massachusetts bring this action against McKinsey and Company for violating the Consumer Protection Act out of the state of Massachusetts. The Commonwealth brings this action for consulting services that it provided to opioid companies in connection with designing the company's marketing plans and programs that helped and caused and contributed to the opioid crisis. McKinsey sold its ideas to Purdue Pharma more than, for more than 15 years from 2004 to 2019, including before and after Purdue's 2007 guilty plea for felony misbranding. So they got in trouble, Purdue did, and they just kept on selling them for another 10, uh, 12 years. Kept working for them. McKinsey advised Purdue and other manufacturers to target prescribers who write the most prescriptions for the most patients and thereby make the most money for McKinsey's clients. 
Here's some of what they did. In 2013, McKinsey conducted another analysis of Oxy's growth for Purdue, and they laid out new plans to increase the sales of Oxy. Among the key components McKinsey's plan adopted by Purdue were A, to focus sales calls on high volume opioid prescribers, including those who wrote as many as 25 times as many Oxycontin scripts as their lower volume counterparts. They identified the doctors who were writing these things like Skittles and they went and sold them more. B, they removed sales representatives discretion in targeting prescribers. So go, just, just uh, go, go get them. C, focus Purdue's marketing messaging to titrate to higher, more lucrative dosages. So you, you start on a small dose, work your way up. Higher the dose, higher the cost of the, of the pill, more money you make. Just slowly, once you get them addicted, slowly raise the price. Significantly increase the number of sales visits to high volume prescribers. So just start banging on the doctor's doors. E, create an alternative model for how patients receive Oxycontin, including direct distribution to patients and pharmacies to help address product access problem. It's hard to get it. When a large pharmacy chain recognized this and took steps to scrutinize suspicious opioid orders, McKinsey stressed to Purdue's owners the, quote, need to take action. Uh-oh, they're going to start limiting the, the, the distribution of this. We got to take action on this urgent issue affecting Oxy. McKinsey told Purdue's owners to engage in senior level discussions with the pharmacy chain to increase efforts with patient advocacy groups to clamor against dispensing limits and accelerate considerations of an alternative distribution channel, such as delivering them directly through mail order, form, uh, mail order pharmacies. After their platform, McKinsey continued to work with Purdue, including on a project that identified the growing addiction crisis, let's, let's make you sick, as a profit-making opportunity. McKinsey continued to work with Purdue, including on a project that identified the growing addiction crisis as a profit-making opportunity. These people are sick. McKinsey told Purdue that it should strive to become a provider across the spectrum of drug abuse and addiction because of the opportunities it presented. McKinsey advised Purdue to get into the manufacturing and marketing of opioid rescue and treatment medications in order to profit from the realities of dependence, addiction, and misuse. Indeed, in 2018, Purdue owner Dr. Richard Sackler received a patent for a drug to treat opioid addiction. They were distributing the drugs, getting everybody addicted. Then when they were addicted, they provided the treatment. Treatment medications, opioid addiction drugs. Some of the most evil people on the planet, as far as I can tell. Paragraph 23, subsequently in the wake of hundreds of thousands of opioid deaths and thousands of lawsuits, McKinsey proposed a plan for Purdue's exit from the opioid business, whereby Purdue would continue selling opioids as a way to fund new Purdue ventures. According to McKinsey, the change was necessary because of the negative events that material compromised uh, the Purdue brand. Then afterwards, there are indications that individuals at McKinsey Consider destroying or deleting documents related to their work for Purdue. So I want to just pay a little special attention here. McKinsey proposed a plan for Purdue's exit. McKinsey is a very smart company. They know what they're doing. The most world-renowned, one of the most world-renowned consulting companies on the planet. Very good. Do you think that they, they really knew what they were doing here? I do, right? If, if you're the smartest people on the planet, you would know that. I think you would also probably include in your cost-benefit analysis, in your budget for what this project looks like over the course of 15 years, your legal fees, right? Just like car companies will settle in on, on an audit or a, uh, what's it called? A recall. You remember that scene from Fight Club? They do a calculation. It's going to kill more people going to be more expensive because of that we got to do a recall if it's not going to kill that many people and it costs more to, to settle than it does to do a recall they don't do the recall here i would guess that mckinsey factored into their analysis into their profitability their legal claims and settling it they developed an entire exit strategy for purdue do you think that they did not have an exit strategy for them 
Do you think that they were not billing Purdue at a level that would justify their costs? Were they under litigation? Did they just not think about that? Or is this $573 million settlement just the cost of doing business for them? Is it really a penalty? Or is it just part of the equation? Not to mind the thousands of dead people, if not more than that, tens of thousands of dead people, including my younger brother, who got started on the road to, to death as a result of this, exactly this. My brother broke his wrist, had a number of surgeries, was prescribed oxy and oxy and oxy and oxy and oxy. He had hundreds of pills that were being delivered to him from various doctors, all handing them out like Skittles. When he could not get them anymore, he was already addicted for years, he turned to something harder than that. And that was basically the end of it. 2016, he died by suicide. I'm not alone in that story. It's happening across this country, everywhere, as a result of what took place here. These people are criminals. I have seen and represented a lot of people who have been called criminals. Most of them are not. Most of them are good people who have been charged with crimes. These people are the upper class, business class, CEO, oligarchy individuals who get away with the most heinous crimes in America. They pay a fine, a couple hundred million dollars, and they all skirt away with it. Nobody bats an eye. We're helping the community. We're going to solve the opioid crisis. They were getting rich on both ends of it. And now they're going to get away with paying some money that was already calculated by my estimation in their equation. They don't have to acknowledge any responsibility, any wrongdoing. I've got a dead brother. Thousands of other families have dead kids, dead husbands, dead wives, dead sisters. These guys issue a press release. That's all I have to say about that. <sighs> all right, next story. Speaking of losing people that this world should not lose. This story came over from Ratchet Friday Media. It's a demonic system. Officer Clyde Kerr, his final words before committing suicide behind police brutality. A black police officer from Louisiana killed himself after sharing a series of videos online saying he had, quote, had enough of serving a system that does not give a damn about him or other African-Americans. Clyde Kerr, age 43, Lafayette Parish Sheriff's deputy, died by suicide on Monday after speaking extensively about the demonic criminal justice system and the killings of black men, including George Floyd. Clyde Kerr. Another suicide in this country. He died by suicide after he left haunting videos on racing, racist policing. He said, I've had enough. Before Deputy Clyde Kerr took his own life on Monday outside the Lafayette Parish Sheriff's Office, he left haunting words, final words, in a series of social media videos. Kerr, a father and a military veteran, was 43 years old. In Kerr's videos, he talked directly to the police on a range of issues from police brutality against black people and mental health needs in policing to division in society, to children's exposure to murder, violence, and other negative traumatic influences. He also describes his struggle to reconcile his identity as a black man with his profession while hinting at his impending suicide. Kerr said he was done serving a system that doesn't care about people like him. You have no idea how hard it is to put on a uniform on this day and age with everything that's going on, he said. My entire life has been in the service of people. Y'all entrust me to safeguard your little ones, your small ones, the thing that's most precious to you. And I did that well. I passed security clearance in the military, but that has allowed me to see the inner workings of things. The videos show a man who professed he was upset by the state of society. I've had enough. Let 
let's listen to him. He's not with us anymore. This is Deputy Clyde Kerb. And it's just dawned on me that this time, as of now, needs to be seized because we don't really give a damn about us. That is the truth. That is the truth. I've served with a full heart in the military. After that, got back into law enforcement, and you have no idea how hard it is to put a uniform on in this day and age with everything that's going on. Here's another one from him. Across the board. Mental health and wellness, they definitely need that. Look, we need, I don't know how we're going to do it. We get one, one. People get one uh, psyche valve or just checkup. And that's in the hiring process. And some people have squeaked through because I know some cops that should not be cops, honestly. They just, I don't think they have the, the makeup for it. And they're going to say, oh, he did. No, this, this not, not even night and day. Whether it be, I don't think annual is good because a lot can happen a year, whether that be semi-annual or quarterly. It needs to happen. And, it's, it is, and the stigma that is surrounding it needs to um, be lifted too because that is insane. We need help. People need help. It is okay to say you need help. It's a shame that he's not around anymore. We have to, we have to see him not here anymore in order to hear his message that people need help. Takes a man taking his own life in order for us to just pause and say, hey, maybe we should focus on some of these issues. I support the good police. I beat up on the police a lot on this channel because I think that we can do better. The good police on this, in this world, they need to be supported. They do need more help. They need more mental help. I'm good with all of that. All right. Let me talk about some other criminal justice solutions here. This came up recently. We have spent a lot of time talking about some solutions. The first solution for situations like this, we have to identify people who need help in law enforcement. I've said this for a long time. Identify people who are prone to violence, who are on the edge, who are just buckling under the pressure of the job. If we can help those people, I think that would spread throughout the department at the, the, the lowest part of the ship of the building would be lifted up and the rest of everybody would be better off for it. I went through my slides from the last year or so. I've got some other thoughts on some criminal justice ideas. It has come up a couple times this week where people have been asking about what, what can we do? What are the solutions? How do we help prevent this stuff? How do we reform the criminal justice system so that cops like this guy who are not working with other individuals who are a part of the problem? Clyde Kerr, one of the good ones, we don't have him anymore. Why not? He, you just heard from him. Why are there other cops who shouldn't be cops who get through that are contributing to this cycle where one guy just says enough already, I'm out. I'm out, can't do it. There's an internal conflict. There's an internal contradiction that exists within him. And he just said, I can't take it anymore. He's a guy who defined himself by being of service, by caring for your little ones. All of these military credentials wanting to serve, being a part of an institution called a police department that is supposed to serve, and he's operating from within that structure and doesn't believe that he's living his true purpose. He's not living his calling. He wants to serve. He's in an entity that is not service. Contradictions too much. That's the end of it for him. So how do we fix that? We've talked about some solutions on this channel. Here's a couple. I went through my slides and just sort of consolidated them into this one table. I'm going to run through these quickly. Police union reform. We've talked about that a lot here. 
I would encourage permanent record keeping. Okay. They want to delete records in their contracts with city councils. That has to stop open door investigations. We want to see what the investigations look like and what you're doing. Termination, get rid of the bad cops. The unions stop protecting them. Qualified immunity needs to be addressed. Legislation to end the qualified immunity rules. It's court precedent. It's not in legislation. It has been created by the courts acting as a legislature that has to be eliminated. The legislature can take the power back and end qualified immunity. Brady violation registries. When officers can commit mis misconduct, we need to know about it. They cannot hide in the shadows anymore. We want to help the bad officers. If it's somebody who is engaged in misconduct, why is that? Are they bad people or are they in a bad moment in their life? Can we help re rehabilitate that person? Are they capable of being a good officer? We don't know. We can't keep track of their misconduct. Information sharing. Defense attorneys have a nightmare finding out who the bad police are. Independent civil review boards. Independent bodies, not the police investigating themselves. Independent bodies investigating the police. The judge made up of judges, prosecutors, and defense attorneys. Or similar individuals, not politicians. Mandatory body cameras. I understand we just passed a $1.9 trillion spending bill here in Congress today. We can just round that up to $2 trillion. Buy every single police officer in this country a body camera. No excuses for that. De-escalation units. Officers who are specifically trained to de-escalate part of the standard response. They just go around now. If they're responding to a particular call that might involve some violence, there's a de-escalation team there. If it's a mental health crisis, you call in the mental health team, just like you have a SWAT team. Okay. If they start shooting at cops, the SWAT team's there in 10 seconds. If they identify a mental health issue, why can't a mental health team be there in also 10 seconds? Bail reform, reduce or eliminate cash bail and improve release condition defaults. The poor people are the ones who sit in custody. The rich people post bail and get out. It's not right. It's not fair. Sentencing reform, eliminate the three strikes philosophy, which was introduced largely in the 90s as a result of the 1994 crime bill and the rest of the bills that came out in the 80s and 90s. Three strikes is garbage. It doesn't necessarily exist in, in statutes anymore, but there's a lot of it in sentencing provisions, particularly here in Arizona. Three strikes, you go to prison forever. Decriminalization, purge the victimless criminal laws. We have so many laws on the book. We're seeing a movement on this already. Arizona just decriminalized, legalized marijuana, recreational marijuana for adults or minimize the severity. Not everything needs to be a misdemeanor. We can go back to some petty crimes. You don't have to automatically punish the hell out of people, which leads me to my next point, justice and culture reform from punitive to rehabilitative. Stop with the punishment. You cannot punish the pain out of people. You cannot grind them into a pulp and expect them to come out better. Stop stigmatizing them by plastering their mug shots all over the internet and start treating people with some entity, empathy. Gosh. And how about some drug and alcohol programs? Maybe some treatment programs, maybe some mental health programs with mandatory participation in lieu of a jail or a prison. And it's mandatory. If it's, alter it's alternative. Right. That's an alternative proposal in lieu of jail or prison. Just some thoughts. <sighs> All right. Let's go into the super chats now. Let's see what we've got. We have we're going to we're going to transition out of that energy transition into some nice energy. It's going to be good. All right. Let's go over to number one. We got farmer's daughter in the house says, here's an interesting article on Blaze today, basically implying there may be a need to take out domestic terror, terrorists with drone attacks. God help us all. You know, the drone stuff, I think, is pretty interesting. I think I just saw an article from, uh, from somebody saying that some country has these drones now that you can shoot in sort of a, a, a launcher that just launches them all up, and then they can sort of swarm attack you. It's going to be a weird time. And if the drones can get even smaller, what if we have these little bees buzzing around now and they can just come and land in your property and just start uh, surveilling you? 
it's going to be it's going to be interesting. I think Scott Adams actually wrote a book about that where he was saying that drones would be the primary form of terrorist attacks in the future, right? I mean, it'd be pretty easy. You steal a stick of C4, throw it on a drone, fly it into a building, there you go. And I think I saw another headline today that eight pounds of C4 are missing from some military institution. So that's great. We have another one from Sharon Quidney says, okay, so now we have a complete reversal of meaning. They quote, saved democracy by destroying the entire democratic process. Is this 1984? Or are we more like in the matrix? Yeah, they, they do this a lot. They will actually take a sentence or a word or a concept that, and just sort of repurpose it. So they'll say, you know, we believe in, uh, you know, what do they say about, about Trump? that he was trying to steal an election. Well, they kind of said that for like three years, right? They kind of said that he's an illegitimate president, not my president. He's Putin's president. He's Putin's puppet. The Russians got him elected a bunch of nonsense. And then they realized, well, that's kind of a, 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 that didn't work for us. So let's, why don't we just accuse him of what we did? We're going to accuse Trump and the Republicans of stealing the election, even though by our own acknowledgement, we were part of a shadow campaign. That was a cabal of rich people who, well, they kind of rigged the whole thing in their own article. Jeremy Matrita says, I believe this article lays out what Biden referred to in his interview. Quote, we have put together, I think, the most extensive and inclusive voter fraud organization in the history of American politics. That's from Jeremy. Yeah, Jeremy. You know, I thought that that was just a slip of the tongue on that. You know, voter prevention fraud organization is, I thought, something that he was opposed to. Or, or he, he was in favor of a voter fraud prevention organization. But he may have just been speaking the truth and we all just gave him a pass on that. We have Harry 1636 says rank and file union members have been badly let down by their leadership, in my opinion. If union leaders would spend a little less time hammering employers who are putting money in their members' pockets and focus on the people taking money out of their pockets, the government, they could clean up their image a lot. Yeah, you know, I, I, um, I, I, don't know much about other unions. I know I d really dislike the police unions, really dislike them. I think that they protect bad police officers who shouldn't be on there. So if that is something that's kind of happening across the board in different industries, I can imagine it's kind of the same, the same pattern there. And I think the union leaders are sort of feeling the heat now, right? They were the ones who were supporting Joe and Kamala and now that they canceled the Keystone XL pipeline, they're all sort of backtracking a little bit. We have Chris Wiseman says, sure does feel like January 6th was a Reichstag fire 2.0. It does, doesn't it? The day after the normalcy statesman, President Hindenburg signed the Reichstag. Fire decree at the insistence of the powerful radical socialist elements of the government. You know, there are some, Chris, there are some interesting videos. Actually, somebody posted, uh, what's her name? I can't, I'm sorry, I miss your name. Uh, but somebody posted a very interesting, well done video on locals that was about 20 minutes long. And it was a, a, a sort of a decomposition of what happened at the Capitol Hill protest that day. And it was essentially saying the whole thing was illegitimate. And I'm not sure that I would go that far, but it was very well done. It was very compelling in terms of its editing and its production style was was very good. I was like, wow, this who edited this? This is a ton of work. Uh, I know because I have tried to do something like, I don't know, a 10th as skilled as that was. And I, it was difficult for me. <laughs> it didn't work out very well. So I was very impressed by that. So, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of alternative thought processes on who was really behind this. You know, my big question this entire time about the Capitol Hill stuff is why was security so bad if they all knew that it was going to be so dangerous? And we heard this. AOC's confirmed it. Uh, all of the other politicians have confirmed it. Trump supporters are going to come here and wreck America. All right. Well, if you knew that, then why did you, why did you, it's, it wasn't even that you just didn't ask for enough security. It was that you literally disavowed the, the federal government sending in additional security. We saw that in writing from Mayor Bowser in her letter over to the security apparatus. Chris Wiseman says the decree suspended most civil liberties in Germany, including habeas corpus, freedom of expression, freedom of the press, freedom of association, public assembly, and the secrecy of the post and the telephone. Good thing we've learned the lessons of history, so we're not doomed to repeat that. Yeah, so you know, currently, I think we still have habeas corpus. That's pretty good. Freedom of expression is kind of on the ropes. Freedom of the press, uh, you know, I'm not real sure that we have much of a press anymore. 
Uh, but certainly if you want to include, you know, kind of independent journalists or bloggers or commentators, yeah, that, that's also on the ropes. Free association is basically non-existent now because of uh, most of our association can't take place in public anymore, right? We're all on lockdown. Everybody's social distancing. So most of the association is taking place digitally, which is why we're talking about a digital bill of rights. And uh, currently, yeah, that's on the ropes. Public assembly, uh, yeah, that was gone last March. The secrecy of the post and the telephone, that's also yeah, way gone out the window because we know Bank of America was uh, allowing the feds to go in and look at your private financial records. We also know that a lot of the government intelligence agencies can just gobble up anything that is being you know, sent through any one of the social media platforms, thanks to Edward Snowden and to Julian Assange. Uh, same with email, same with your phone. So yeah, so you're right, Chris. I think, I think basically uh, habeas corpus will probably be kind of the last one. Expression gone, press on the ropes, association, assembly, telephone, post. Yeah. Good thing we've learned the lessons of history, so we're not doomed to repeat them. Yeah, that can't happen in America. Nope, sure can't. We got Danny Girl says, I've been watching your show for a few months, but I have not participated in the Super Chats because I refuse to give a dollar to YouTube Google Alphabet. Keep up the great work. We love you guys, and you must know that what you are doing is so important in these crazy times. Thank you, Danny Girl. I, I understand that. I'm glad that you made it over to Locals. Uh, I think they're, I think the, the sort of the... The leadership over there is of the right mindset for people who want to continue to talk about ideas, even if they're not part of the mainstream narrative. Very grateful to have you here. Thanks for the support. And thanks for watching. Danny Girl. We have Farmer's Daughter says, so Biden was admitting this before he was inaugurated. Quid pro Joe, LOL. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess he was. He was telling us exactly what was happening here. And we just gave him the old man pass. We said, oh, he's just confused. You know, it's just Sleepy Joe being sleepy again. And he is just, he doesn't know what he's saying. He meant the voter fraud prevention organization. We don't want voter fraud. And he was, no, we're, we're like, no, we're doing it. Like we have a whole secret campaign. <laughs> like it's, it's Pod Hertz and it's this guy and it's all these guys. And uh, Zuck, we were at Zuckerberg's for dinner last night. And he said, no, we're a part of it. We're in, we're in. Sharon Quidney. So the elites have now shown themselves, letting everybody know how they fixed everything. How on earth can anybody who isn't in line with their ideology fight against them? Well, I, you know, we just have to keep, we just have to keep going, right? I mean, what, what alternative is there? First of all, it's not just that, right? It's not just keep going on. Oh, just keep trudging along. These ideas are universal. They're, they're immutable. Okay, we talk about inalienable rights, freedom of speech, expression, association. These are just natural human rights. They're trying to take those away. It doesn't work out. It just doesn't work out. Anytime in history that they've tried to do that, it just doesn't work out. I'm not sure where it's going to go, but we're going to find out. Chairman of the board said, couple this article with the Veritas video that came out a few days ago, and it looks pretty bad. This sounds like a major campaign violation with in-kind Facebook donations, probably worth millions. Seems like a pretty clear case of election interference. Isn't this a federal crime? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you can make some very good arguments for that, right? Why is that money being, being pumped into basically Democratic coffers, into Democratic organizations? They're all going to say that this is just donation money that is, you know, used to protect the integrity of the election. It's your integrity. It's your version of integrity. You're changing the rules in violation of the Constitution, in my opinion, because the legislature still has the authority to govern how elections are run. The courts change them. The election commissions change them. The executive branches throughout the country, they all change the rules. Zuckerberg came in and just dumped a bunch of money and said, yeah, we're going to support those efforts, by the way, because we believe in election integrity. It's our version, though. Jeremy Mitra says a great way to secure voting is by making polling places as secure as a Vegas casino. They have had years of experience of combating cheating at gambling machines. They, the, the, the voter integrity stuff, I think, is easily solvable. We've got enough technology now. We have enough know-how. We can figure this out. But they don't want to figure it out. Right. If, if you had to say, look, every single voter has to have ID. They got to show up at a polling place. They got to vote on a paper ballot. They got to do it by election night at eight o'clock. If it's not any of those things, you don't your vote doesn't count. Sorry. Unless you're grandma and you can't move, we'll, we'll mail you a ballot. Only you, though. OK, if you're 35 year old male, you're coming down to the voting place. Get up. Stop being lazy. This is America. Go into a voting booth and vote on a paper ballot with transparency. I, I, I mean, 
Is that complicated? Not really. But I think both parties have a vested interest in the obscurity of how the elections are run. Chris Wiseman says, hypocrisy, thy name is DOJ. All right, we have another. Where did this story come from? The Department of Justice charged a Trump supporting Twitter troll with election interference because he posted memes in 2016 telling Democrats to vote for Hillary Clinton. The DOJ states that the alleged injuries, oppression, threats, and intimidation, quote, spread by these individuals often took the form of memes. This criminal complaint defines memes as amusing, interesting items, such as captioned pictures or video, or genre of items that is spread widely online, especially through social media. Mackey faces 10 years in prisons for a joke. Yeah, we covered this story. Let's see another one. The vote from home memes urged Clinton supporters to vote from the comfort of their own homes via text message. Draft Our Daughters was a satirical social media hashtag encouraging American women to register for selective service in preparation for the military that would be launched by Clinton. 2016, Christina Wong, a comedian and elected representative to a Los, uh, and elected representative to a Los Angeles district, tweeted Trump supporters to skip the poll lines at election 2016 and text in your vote. Text votes are legit or vote tomorrow on Super Wednesday. Unlike Mackey, Wong, who was not banned from Twitter and still has her verified checkmark, was a public official who, under the color of law, was spreading false voting information and violating the Voting Rights Act, has not been charged by any wrongdoing by the Los Angeles DA, California Attorney General, or the U.S. Attorney's Office. Mackey posted some memes that were anti-Hillary. Trolling. Trolling which happens on the internet. That's like half the reason to be on the internet is to deal with the trolls. It's a lot of fun. As long as it's not directed at you. If you watch trolls going after other people, it's kind of fun to watch the trolls. 10 years arrested by the U.S. Attorney's Office, by the Biden DOJ for posting memes five years ago in 2015, 2016. Public congressperson, Christina Wong, apparently, who I'd never heard of until today. She did the same thing. Okay, good to go because she was doing it against the Trump people. Thank you for that, Chris. I did not see that. That's a good follow-up. This is a pretty good format. Kind of do some follow-ups on the other stories that we covered. We cover so many things, it's just it's hard to do follow-ups. Sharon Quidney says, aren't any of these things they're admitting to illegal? Well, Sharon, it's not illegal to save America. Hello, it's not, Im- it's not illegal to fortify American democracy. It's only illegal if you do those things to undermine American democracy. So, yes, the conduct and the intent, you could probably make an argument that it was illegal. But the purpose, their hearts were in the right place. They had to oust the orange dictator from America. He was crumbling the very foundation of our institutions, you know, by asking for like election integrity and maybe saying, hey, why don't we let the American people hear from hear hear the facts? That might be good. For this country? They said no. Can't hear what he has to say because he's dangerous. The information is dangerous. An entirely nice little campaign they had going on there. We have Jeremy Metrida says, keep the faith. You mean Miss Faith? I'm going to. I'm not going anywhere. Not all is lost. The office of the former president of the United States has been established to help take the majority of the state legislatures across the country. The best thing we can do is unite and stand up against these people. You're absolutely right, Jeremy. I am not losing faith, either the person or the motivation for moving this country forward. We're going to keep on keeping on here. Thanks for the support and the shout out to everybody else to keep the faith. I think, I think, you know, like I said, the country's in a little bit of a wilderness right now, but we're going to work our way through it. And I think we're going to be stronger on the other end. Sea Wolf says, Time Life also suppressed a lot of information immediately after JFK's death, including the Zapruder film. The Z film was not finally made public until 1975. That's interesting. I did not know that. So Time Magazine, not surprising to see what side Time takes in this situation. Yeah, interesting. Thank you, Seawolf. Liberty or Death in the House says, Rob, just remember, the left has decided that they can run your life better than you. We must thank our overlords. I know, I don't know why I think that I know what to do or what to say or how to think or like where to go find information. You know, typically when I see something, I uh, I ask a couple questions like, where did this come from? Who's saying it? Why are they saying it? Does this mix with my version of reality that I know that I see? That's a lot of work. 
I, mean, I got to like stop and think about stuff. It's just way easier if they just put a little context bar down at the bottom and say, uh, this is bad information and dangerous. Then I can go, oh, okay, that's all. good. All right, so I'll just keep on scrolling then. I don't need to see that. It's, it's even better though. That, that does actually take some time out of my day. I mean, actually you have to stop and read that. It's better if they just remove it. Just take it off the platform. It saves me a lot of time. It saves my brain, my limited brain that's so small and dumb from having to work so hard. You know, I just have to just sit here and just grind away on my life and just accept whatever CNN tells me. We have NY Renal MD says, I work with opioid patients. As a medical resident, Purdue used to sponsor activities in our residency. As a chief resident, I had reps numbers in my phone. This is all true. Yeah, I know. I know it is. My family lived through it. Thanks for sharing that. You're seeing it on the other end. We have, I think these revelations and their flagrant audacious attitudes are part of their fear campaign. It's sending a message intended to be disconcerting to the opponents. The Germans used tactics like they were invading, like these on the invading Americans in World War II. The Statute of Liberty is kaput. Yeah, it, it is. It is very interesting that it is just so obvious, right? I mean, it's literally in writing. They're literally saying there was a shadow campaign. They use the word cabal. They also use the word rigged. Like they're just saying it. I thought that we weren't allowed to say that stuff anymore. YouTube had a policy. Twitter has a policy. Now it's okay to talk about apparently. All right. We have another one from Farmer's Daughter says, I plan to disconnect from the news this weekend. When I see you as disgusted as you are, Robert, instead of your easygoing self, I know it's time to take a break. I'm a coin collector and been watching my coins shows more lately. Will be a great way to spend my weekend. I think that's a great idea, Farmer's Daughter. You know, these stories today hit a little bit close to home, so it's, uh, it's, it's tough to be lighthearted and jovial when you have this type of garbage going on around this country, but, you know, it's, it's just the world that we're living in, and we've all got a part that we can do to help improve it. We're all going to continue to move that ball forward. As part of that journey, we do need to take breaks. We do need to disconnect and take care of ourselves. Because if we're not well, if we're not energized, if we're not fortified, we can't go out and be inspirational to other people. We can't go out and save that next person who's having a breakdown, and they need some help putting things back together. When we're rested, when we're stable and productive, things are better. I used to like, I used to collect coins as a kid too. Maybe I'll get back into that. Thanks for sharing that. Have a wonderful weekend there, farmer's daughter. Next up, we got another one. Dr. Renal MD, NY Renal MD says, I teach medical residents now. It's my life work to counter all the damage done for all that have someone touched by opiates have compassion. It's one of the most difficult diseases to kick. Some can only, can only manage chronically. Take away the stigma of methadone and suboxone therapy. Yeah, it should have been just XUXA says should have been 573 trillion. Yeah, there's no more. I mean, you know, 573 million. There are a lot of dead people in this country as a result of their activities. Knowingly, they knew what they were doing. They were doing it anyways. They're not admitting any fault for it escaping with total immunity from further lawsuits for a cool 573 million for a billion dollar company that was probably already incorporated into their business model that was part of the plan that's not a fine that's just the cost of doing business Britt Reed says I'm being a more discerning news consumer. I stay away from the stuff that the mainstream media concentrates on, such as AOC's latest drama queen antics. I'm listening to shows like this instead. It, helped me, it helps my mental well-being. I'm also re-engaging with some of my hobbies again. It has reduced my stress levels considerably. You know, Britt, I'm doing the same thing, honestly. It's funny that you mention all of this. I mean, I specifically didn't really cover, we didn't cover AOC's story. We got some, some, some questions about it, but it's a lot of drama, right? It's all just drama. It's shiny object BS. They're, they're trying to, you know, puff up AOC. The left's trying to do the same thing with Marjorie Taylor Greene, who nobody ever heard of until very recently. So all of that stuff is just noise. 
And you got to remember that what the mainstream or the corporate media or whatever you want to call it, what they're, what they like to do, what the big news sites like to do is get you agitated. It's intentional. They know that every time you get a little bit angry, you get a little bit riled up, you get that hit of dopamine in your head. And so we come back like rats to press that button, to get another pellet, to get that hit of dopamine in our brains. That's how they keep you addicted and coming back. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? What happened? That's not life though. I'm glad you're getting back into your hobbies. I'm glad you're feeling better. I, I largely unplug uh, from a lot. That's not true. I'm on Twitter basically all day. Let's be real. All right. Let's not, let's, let's be real, but I am working on it. I'm doing my best to not get super in, in, encompassed by this stuff. I used to do a lot of my show prep early in the morning before I went to the gym, just kind of avoiding that now, right? We're just going to push that back. Uh, I want a free and clear morning with no stress. Uh, go work out. Actually, apparently somebody at on locals, uh, saw, saw me there this morning. We, we feel free to say hi, and I will give you a spot next time if you need it. As long as you'll reciprocate that I could, I could work on my bench press a little bit. I need a spot. So, you know, that type of stuff is good. Keep a clear morning, get back to your hobbies. Uh, I'm doing that. I'm sort of relearning to love to read again. And it's really, really, really relieving. Just like you said, thanks for sharing that Brit. Another one from Sharon says, uh, no, this one, where'd this one go? Chris Wiseman says, thanks for sharing your story. It was hard to watch, but thank you for being raw and real. It really does make an impact. And you have a community here on Locals that will take that story to heart. Yeah, thanks, Chris. And I didn't know how that was going to go today. Uh, it's, a, it's a rough thing. Sharon Quinney says, so many depressed people and feeling hopeless. It's so sad. Suicide, drugs, the stigma has to go. Drug addiction is an illness that is so hard to overcome. People need help, not the further ruining of their lives. Couldn't have said it better, Sharon. I completely agree with that. It's really, really sad that the first instinct of people is to say, oh, that's just a drug addict. What a loser. Almost like subhuman. Now he's gone. He's just a drug addict. Throw him in jail. He's been, he's been charged with three drug crimes. Obviously, he's not getting it. How many times we've heard that from prosecutors? We're just going to see him in here again. We're going to see him here next month. If we give him this deal, so we're not going to give him this deal. So what's the answer then? Prison? You want to send him to prison for four years? Okay. Another one from Farmer's Daughter says, Bravo, too many folks would rather be part of the problem than the solution. You have not let your life experiences harden you. It has rather given you a heart of gold and a fire in your belly. That's nice. I like that. I do feel like I got a little bit of a fire in the belly here today. No question about it. I'm kind of amped up, folks. I, I got to be honest. I'm kind of amped up. We have, hey, we got the, the, the Ma Fox in the house, says, Robert, we need to tackle the issue of Americans treating prior convicts like second-class citizens. There is a huge issue with how the American culture constantly attacks prior felons as, and, as criminals indefinitely for the rest of their life. Awesome point there, Ma. You know, this is, I think, absolutely correct. The people who have been convicted of crimes, who go to prison, who complete their probation, who pay their fines, they have paid their debt. They've done their part. Apparently, they committed some harm against society, even if it's just possessing and using drugs on their own. That's very offensive to many Americans and society, uh, apparently. And they think you have to go to prison for that. That's the only way that they're going to fix you. You're a drug addict. The only way we can fix this and repair the harm that you have done by using drugs on your own is to send you to prison for, I don't know, five years. Like that's going to help. They've done their time. They've completed their probation. They have paid their debt to that make-believe harm that many people believe exists. Now, there are some crimes that are harmful to society, right? I'm, I'm using one example because it obviously proves my point. But after they've come out, they continue to be stigmatized. They're felons forever until they restore their rights, which many courts just don't do. They have permanent disabilities in the terms of you know, finding jobs, finding places to live. It's horrendous. And it's a cultural thing. I think you're right, Mom. A lot of people, they like to see their fellow man down. They like to say, I'm better because that person's bad. Bad, bad, bad. Well, you're kind of a piece of garbage too. Yeah, but I'm not a drug addict. I'm not a convict. I'm just an all around general a-hole in society. And so, you know, everybody likes to or organize themselves in that hierarchy. And the people who get dumped on the quickest and the easiest are the criminals. 
which is why I absolutely love representing them because they're forgotten. We're not going to let that happen here. Sarah Smothers says, it would be nice to see trade programs push so for first-time offenders, they have something to do after prison besides going back to a life of crime. Yeah, Sarah, exactly right. There's so much more we can do, and I don't know why society is not considering this to be a higher priority. Those are our fellow citizens. Those are our brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, husbands, and wives. We want them to be better when they get back. We want them to be a stronger, more fortified person. Prison doesn't do that. They come out weaker with many more disadvantages. Who pays for that? Society does in the form of recidivism, in the form of more crime, more abuse, more drugs, more alcohol. It's a bad cycle. We can break that cycle. And I think you're on the right track with that. Thank you, Sarah. Chris Wiseman says, thoughts on expanding veterans courts, incorporating drug rehab, PTSD, mental services, plugging in the VA system to make sure they are being seen and treated. Second suggestion for enhanced warrant requirements for SWAT operation and restrict SWAT use in serving warrants. Two very good suggestions there. Two very good suggestions. You know, the, the veterans courts, uh, you know, I think largely, I think largely they're, they're pretty decent here in Arizona. We actually get some good deals out of some of them. Not, not all of our courts here have them. It's sort of a, you know, the courts have to set them up on their own and, um, some don't cooperate particularly well with them. You kind of have to get the prosecutor involved and the judge involved and everybody involved to get it done. But we do get deals there where, you know, where you wouldn't get, you know, say, say if you're a veteran and you got a, a low level DUI, you might be able to work out a deal there where, where they will go do some, some alcohol treatment and then some counseling and drug therapy and all that stuff. Whereas a non-veteran wouldn't get that. So if that was expanded where we said, okay, look, you know, we're going to give you some, some, some options here rather than going to, to jail, which is mandatory for a first offense DUI in Arizona. You go to jail, ma mandatory. Maybe there are some alternatives there to deal with that. Second suggestion, enhance warrant requirements. Yeah, we've seen many of those problems. We saw that with Breonna Taylor. I think it was uh, poorly executed. There should be a lot more oversight on how those warrants are executed with or without SWAT, right? I don't think they had any body cameras on Breonna Taylor. Not that I recall seeing. We, were, we had to hear from a neighbor about how the warrant was executed. Did you knock and announce? Oh, yeah, cops say. Oh, yeah, we knocked. Yeah, we knocked. We announced. Clearly. Loudly, clearly, multiple times. Isn't that true, John? Yeah, isn't that true, Mike? Yeah, oh, yeah. A neighbor comes out and says, uh, no, I didn't hear anything. I mean, I was, I was asleep. I would have heard if they were knocking loudly. I live right next door to Breonna Taylor. Then they get him back like three days later after two other series of questions and suddenly his, his line of thinking changes. Oh, yeah, you're right. I did hear them knocking on Yeah, now that you mention it, three days later, yeah, you're right. Ridiculous. Sharon Quidney says, I'd like to learn more about your digital bill of rights. That's a great idea. Yeah, Sharon. Here's the update on the digital bill of rights. I think we're going to do a live stream tomorrow. I can't pin down a time just yet but I think we'll do it probably tomorrow afternoon. And I know that not everybody will be available at any, any particular given time. So what I'm thinking of doing is just going through what I have thus far, and then we can start a thread over on Locals that will, uh, will be open for further discussion about some of the, the rule changes. I, I have not figured out yet how to incorporate a interactive call with my recording setup right here just yet so I could put it on a zoom and have other people there but then I I only have one camera and I can't use it for for two pieces of software at the same time to my understanding maybe I can I don't know but then you know I'm not sure if people want to um, you know be on camera and all of that stuff so what I'm thinking is I'll sort of do a foundational layout tomorrow and my thought process on this if there's enough interest is once we have a bedrock, once we have, right now I currently have eight changes. So it's, I'm, I'm, I'm framing this as a digital bill of rights that is organized as a constitutional amendment. Right now there are eight, if, if you know your constitution, you've got eight, I'm sorry, you've got 10 of the amendments. The first 10 amendments are called the bill of rights. So what I was doing just to be synergistic is coming up with 10 digital bill of rights for 2021 and beyond. 
So I'm about at about eight of them. And I'm going to go through those tomorrow at some point during the live stream. Then I will post a link to the slides in the thread on locals. Then we can have a conversation about it. That what I'm thinking of, if like I said, if there's enough interest, is having sort of a weekly working session. Okay, we can call it a workshop, a digital bill of rights workshop every Saturday, 1 p.m. Arizona time, something like that. And we just continue to work on it, work on it, work on it, debate it, argue both sides until we get to a, a conclusion. Then we have an amendment that's drafted and we can send that out to all of our senators, all of our representatives and say, hey, introduce this. I know there are some other organizations around the country that are working on a constitutional convention, a convention of the states. That's another alternative. Promote it there and see if we can get into a rhythm. If we could get into a rhythm on this thing and we have other people other than myself working on it, then I think that we can, we can see some movement on this. And I don't know that it's a reality in terms of getting a constitutional amendment on this thing passed, but it's a platform and it's a start. And I don't know anybody else who's doing it, which is embarrassing that we have elected officials in Congress who call themselves free speech people and conservatives. Where is their platform? I have not seen it. If anybody has seen one, I would love to see it, but I haven't seen it. So that's going to happen tomorrow. Maybe we'll pin down the time tomorrow morning. Jason Segal in the house says, want to talk voter suppression. From Amistad Project in Pennsylvania, Mark Zuckerberg and CTCL funded ballot drop boxes that disproportionately benefited Democrats. In Delaware County, a suburb of Philadelphia, there was one drop box every four miles. In the 59 Pennsylvania counties that Donald Trump won in 2016, there was one drop box every 1,100 square miles. From four square miles to 1,100 square miles. And that's the type of stuff that you, thank you for that, Jason Segal. I, I don't know whether that's true or not. I believe it though, because we did cover CTCL and we did cover a lot of the, the Zuckerberg stuff back when that was in place. And it is, it's, it's frustrating because you can't identify that as anything. You can't identi identify that as fraud. Yeah. We have uh, XN Drew says, I'm a fan of your police reform efforts. Election stories, not so much. I don't feel like it's your expertise. It's a good observation because it's not, ex Andrew. I'm not an expert on the election stuff. I'm not. We've been covering a lot of it. We've looked at a lot of litigation and the, the nuts and bolts of it is I'm not a, an, an election lawyer. I'm not. I've never claimed to be. I am a lawyer who's read a lot of legal cases, a lot of case law. My expertise is in criminal law, absolutely. But we're covering election stuff because it's important. It's sort of foundational. What happens at the top with the politicians trickles down into my profession. So as part of my journey here on this channel, I'm trying to learn more about election laws, about election litigation, about a lot of stories. We talked about the SEC stuff. I've never done anything with the SEC. That all goes to the financial people. So I'm just trying to sort of learn and, and grow and evolve as I go through this. And I appreciate you understanding that. We have Farmer's Daughter says, glad you are accepting your male privilege, guilt, and fragility, the trifecta. What I find interesting is that how you can have male privilege, transgender men can compete in women's sports, but there's no sexes or genders, LOL. I can't keep track of it anymore. Honestly, I can't, I don't, I don't know what, uh, you know, basically I just operate, um, as, as, as best I can. And I think all, a lot of this other stuff will sort itself out. We have Jack Elias says, Rob, you are like Tom McDonald, a gangster of the genuine. I'm not sure who Tom McDonald is, but I like the, the concept of being a gangster of the genuine. That's fun. Thank you for that. Jack Elias. We have uh, many minorities have, have gone to prison proportionally. Many more minorities have gone to prison proportionally. Reformation of stigma is a way to level out racial disparity. I am pretty far left, but I dislike political manipulation. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, that's, yeah, that's good. I think, I think that all of that is accurate. Reformation of stigma is a way to level out racial disparity. Many more minorities have gone to prison proportionally. That's, I think, accurate. I'm pretty far left, but you also dislike political manipulation. Well, hey, I'm glad you're here. And I appreciate that, XN Drew. Uh, honestly, I do. You know, I don't want this show to be sort of an echo chamber. I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're pretty far left, as, as you said. But that's what we want. We want ideas. We want conversations here. I don't want this to be an echo chamber. I am not left on most issues, which may be why you don't like my political commentary, why you like my criminal justice reform commentary. So that makes sense. My criminal justice reform commentary is pretty left. My political and free speech ideas are, I would say, pretty far right, libertarian-ish in that regard. Ma Fox says, uh, to further elaborate on my prior comment about the cultural problem with prior convicts, it becomes a self-perpetuating cycle when you suppress people that have been punished by keeping them down so they feel like they must continue criminal behavior to actually make a living. It's nothing but indefinite punitive measures against a person, and it literally ruins people's lives for the rest of their life. Sorry, I'm very passionate about this issue, and it's why I recommend you so highly to friends and colleagues. We need to make a difference. Yeah, thanks, Ma. No need to apologize about it, my friend. I'm very passionate about it, too. It's I've, I've built an entire career and life and company around it because I'm just so passionate about it. I don't like I don't like bad things happening to people in situations that I think are unjust. And that is happening way too much uh, in this country. And it's just not necessary. OK, they are people. They're people just like the rest of us. But people think, well, because they got in, in trouble that they're a monster. They're not. We, we, we represent a lot of people every year. Good people. Sometimes we just get into bumps in the road in, my, in lives. I've had many in mine. I'm sure you've had some in yours. You may not have gotten charged with a crime because of yours, but other people have. Doesn't make them bad people. There's a lot that we can do to help. And Ma, that's why you are so amazing. Because we're in alignment on that. And I know we don't always agree on everything. And you've given me some pointed feedback, which I very much appreciate from other people who've said, Rob, you're kind of going off the deep end over there. Maybe, uh, bu -bu -bu, you know, and some of that I take to heart and some of it I say, that's just how it's going to be. But on the core issues, on things like this, where we're talking about helping people who are not horrendous individuals, who are good people in heart, helping them get back into the world and back being productive members of society, that's good for everybody. We should all want that, I would think. We have X Andrew says, I support your thoughts on the digital bill of rights. A lot of far progressive thinks big tech has too much power and it is capricious in application. That's from X Andrew, who's pretty far left. I, I, I think that my my sort of layout here of the of the digital bill of rights is is uh, I think it's even. You know, I was thinking about it. I don't want it to be one sided because, you know, anything that you put into law, anything that you put into the rule book, one side is going to use it to their advantage. And then when the other side gets their hands on it, they're going to clobber you back with it. Right. We see this all with the filibuster, with the Senate and, you know, Harry Reid killed the filibuster for certain things. Mitch McConnell said, you're going to regret that. You're going to regret that a lot sooner than you think. Boom. Trump gets elected. They're regretting it. Right. And now they're having a whole conversation about it. And so I don't want rules like that. You know, free speech, in my mind, it should be universal just across the board. The Republicans can have as much free speech as they want. So can the Democrats. Neither one of those sides can pick up the free speech club and beat the other side with it. That's currently what I feel is happening, right? There are, there are political people, political operatives who are using the free speech club to beat the hell out of the other side. And I don't like that imbalance because I think it's a stray away from what the founding principles are. Jack Alaya says, I really think you should include Tim Poole on this digital bill of rights. Also talk to Austin Peterson. Tim Poole's kind of big time, man. I don't, he's got a, he's got like a, he's got a, a whole huge following. How do I get a hold of Tim Poole? Anybody have his number? I'll send him a text. Hey bro, I'm tired of this digital, this digital censorship stuff. Let's get working on it. I like Tim Poole. I check him out very regularly. He's freaked out too. <laughs> he's freaked out too. I just checked out his channel today and he's like, uh, I, I'm probably going to get banned soon. So uh, please go support me over here. Right? Everybody's kind of on red alert right now. Good luck to Tim. Good luck to all of us. 
We have Anonymous. He says, thank you for all your work. Have a great weekend. Anonymous, you too. Have an outstanding weekend. I think it's probably going to be the best weekend ever. Just because. Why wouldn't it be? Farmer's Daughter says, for all of you here in the chat, right, left, or in between, lots of hearts, lots of love, lots of prayers, lots of hugs from Farmer's Daughter. And that is a nice way to end our chat session. Our locals chat session. Speaking of locals, want to give a shout out to some of our supporters who are just outstanding, helping us since we just got demonetized. Look at all of these people. We've got uh, a lot of people signed up last night. I'm very grateful. As always, I want to thank Faith and Mr. Ma for helping us with the program. We've got a number of other people who have just been you know, very generous. We've got Sach in the house. we got Shana Wright. We have Dr. EMB is always around. Tim MCD. We've got Corpan over here. we got Quain uh, Stink over here. Look at all these new people who signed up. Just an outstanding. So, so it's amazing to see this. We've got uh, R. Goodson. We have, look at all these people who signed up. We got John Krutz. We got Mole Face. We got R.N. West. We got Crispy Leg. We got Britt Reed. We saw a comment from her today. Jeremy Matrita in the house as well. Saw him. James Dash, D. Sudlow on my knees. We have Lounge Lizard 99 underscore shades joined up. We got Molly May, Cats 59, Grandma Brenda. What's going on, Grandma? Good to see you here. We also have XN Drew. Who is, uh, who is, uh, yes, we heard from XN Drew. Yes, he's our, our far left uh, fellow who doesn't like my political commentary. We're very grateful to have you here because sometimes I don't even like my own political commentary. We have Marvel List ICME. We have Tawny13. We have C. Thoreen. We got Virginia Mary, Tis I, Kulabula in the house. Mr. Pastelio, Dilius, we have Paula MK85, we got Michelle Monique, Jamie Boyd, Office Warrior, go get them, and we got Brother Dave, what's up brother, and then we have the wise one with a number one for the I, the wise one joined up as well, so just, I mean, just so humbling, uh, you know, I, I, I checked the numbers today and I was just like, wow, this is crazy, this is great, and it's, it's, it's because we're building up a different pillar together, right? We're building up a different branch where we can communicate. And there's something relieving about that. You know, when we got demonetized and I, my, my initial instinct was to be just very angry about it. Cause I thought, Oh, the next thing that's going to happen is they're probably going to start deleting videos. Uh, maybe we'll be canceled soon. And it, it just, you know, was, was sort of a, a stream of depressing thoughts, but the idea that, okay, it's going to be a little bit rough. The, the waters are going to be a little bit rocky for the foreseeable future, at least in the online space. People are figuring out where the dust is going to settle, where to make it their home. And just the idea that we can be a part of building what, you know, the next thing, the next community, the next group of individuals who can converse with one another in a conducive environment is just, it's just, it's, it's more exciting than anything. I mean, it's, it's honestly, I think it's, one of the most important things that we can be doing right now, and largely because of the network effect, right? If you have a new platform and there's nobody on it, nobody's going to use it. So you got to start filling it up. And so, you know, for some of you here who are the, the early adopters of this transition, thank you, because you're making it more palatable for the other people who are coming in behind you. You're going inside the building, you're putting some nice decorations up. You're saying, hey, this party's pretty great. Come on in here. Get in here. We're having fun. And people say, what's going on over there? Huh, that looks pretty cool. And so then you get this network effect and it just, it, it, it continues to build and get its, a little bit of its own gravity. And that is so important in order for one of these platforms to stick. And it's not just for watching the watchers, it's for you know, other platforms that are on locals, many of which I check out. So you know, maybe poke around there and, and you know, support some other communities if you would be so inclined, because this is the... You know, until until we get a digital bill of rights, or until we see Section 230 reform, or until we see uh, you know a big a big backlash against some of these big tech companies for silencing a lot of the opposition, this is the alternative, and we want to make this home, and we want to build up a little bit of a of a safe zone for us. And I'm just forever grateful that that uh, people are thinking that way, and seeing the bigger picture, and helping one another. So thank you all for that. If you have not signed up over at locals.com, you can. Most of the stuff is free. We are putting some stuff behind paywalls now because of the demonetization, but uh, this stuff is, is available for free. So as soon as you sign up, you'll see a pinned 
note on there. You don't have to pay anything. You can get all this stuff. Uh, slides, I think, might be, behind, might be behind a paywall now because of the live chat thread. But the impeachment templates are available. The existing system documents are available. That's my personal productivity system. You can do what you want with it. It's totally free. It's their PowerPoint slides. They look like this. I use it every day. It's been a game changer for me. Get a copy of my book over there as well. It's free. Download the PDF. You can also buy it on Amazon if you want it. It's called Beginning to Winning. There are links. People are sharing more and more links. I was, you know, I'm, I'm getting ideas for the show from there. I'm getting feedback from the show from there. The real reason to be over there is the great people. Okay. All of those people that I just listed, many of whom are sharing comments with great ideas. You know, they, they want to get involved. We want to continue to support one another. This is a great place to do it. And so thank you for going over there and for checking that out. The web address is watchingthewatchers.locals.com. And then lastly, of course, if you know anybody who's been charged with a crime in the state of Arizona, that's what we do. I'm a criminal defense lawyer right here at the R&R Law Group. We provide people who've been charged with crimes, good people who've been charged with crimes, with safety, clarity, and hope in their cases and for their futures. And so if you know anybody who wants to you know, clean up a past record, if they have an old record, if they want to restore their rights, regain their ability to possess a firearm, regain their ability to vote, to be a citizen again, remove a mugshot off the internet, quash an old warrant, clear up some traffic tickets, or they're facing a real serious case, something that's active or that they're avoiding. They've got a warrant out for their arrest. That's what we do. We have a whole team of people here that are dedicated to that. And we're very good at what we do. We'd be humbled and honored if you trusted us enough to send them our direction. We'll take very good care of them. So thank you for considering that. Other than that, that's it for the show. That's it for the week. Actually, we'll be back here tomorrow at some point tomorrow afternoon. Not sure what time that is. Keep an eye on locals. Got some things I got to take care of in the morning. Then I want to grind through some finishing touches on the digital bill of rights. And then we're going live tomorrow. So uh, let's, let's maybe think about some of what you might want. If you want to participate in that, think of maybe some things that you might think are critical and then we can deal with it in the live chat tomorrow. As it relates to that show, I'm not going to have a lot of stuff prepared. I'm just going to have that only topic prepared. So if you're looking for news or updates on anything, I'm not going to be prepared for that. So uh, we just want to stay focused on the digital bill of rights. Should be fun. I think it's, a, a, you know, at the very minimal, I think it is a fun exercise for us to think about at the very maximum this is the second era of civil digital rights for America. And if we can be a part of that conversation in whatever form it is implemented in at the end of the day, that is a tremendous accomplishment to the country, to your fellow man and woman, for yourself. So I hope you can join us. That's it for me. Same time, same place on Monday. Random time tomorrow. I'm not sure what it's going to be. But on Monday, we'll be back here. Same place, same time. 5 p.m. Arizona time, which is mountain, 4 p.m. in California, which is Pacific, 6 p.m. Central time over there in Texas, 7 p.m. on the East Coast for Florida Man. Everybody have a tremendous weekend. Thank you once again so much for your support. From the bottom of my heart, from Miss Faith, from Mr. Ma, thank you for your support. Sleep well, be well. I'll see you next week if I don't see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.